In this video, a brand new Ripple partner, and there's an enormous amount of money flowing into crypto over the next couple of years, and I want to talk about the CBDCs. They are heating up. Let's go. And now, the XRP Minute with Chip on the chain. Chip here with the XRP Minute. If it's your first time here, please like, subscribe, click that notification bell. You'll be notified of any new videos that drop. Now, let's dive head first into the shallow end for maximum impact. I wanted to talk a little bit about Brad Garlinghouse's updates on Ripple's cross-border payment network and uh, talking more specifically about on-demand liquidity, ODL, the platform. He said that um, XRP and ODL are crucial to Ripple's global expansion and long-term success. And in the three years that RippleNet has been live, they've done over 2 million transactions with a nominal value of over 7 billion U.S., we have hundreds of customers. We're seeing the greatest traction across Asia. And that's no surprise, really, because Asia has been very, very friendly, especially Japan. We see China also talking about their own CBDC, but especially Japan and SBI being very, very uh, upfront, leading the pack. And also the fact that Japan has embraced cryptocurrency where other parts of the world. We have Europe now jumping on board and we also have the U.S. So another stat that they that they talked about, they said ASIMO who has talked publicly about some of their experience, said they're saving between 30 and 50% when arranging currency transfers between customers in the Philippines and those in the UK and Europe using ODL. I think we can say without reservation that 2020 has been a huge year for ODL, and we're continuing to see rapid growth as we hit the back half of 2020. We're also excited by that interest from customers who were even excited in the quarantine customers deriving real value from that. Last week, Ripple announced the launch of its new line of credit uh, product, which allows ODL customers to leverage XRP for the transactions. Garlinghouse said the product reflects the company's view that XRP is the future of RippleNet. And that's really what the line of credit centers around. It has to do with companies that, you know, maybe um, have some delays in payments or cash flow. They'll be able to get a pretty sizable line of credit. Um, I think it's up to 10 million USD. And also they have anywhere from, from, I don't think they could charge any interest until after seven days. And after those seven days are up, then it starts being charged interest. They have up to a year. It averages between, I think, four and six percent. Saw this tweet from Wrath of Conman. According to the head of FinTech Digital Bank, OCB in Vietnam is a new Ripple strategic partner as of today. Great, fine, right guys, right guys, then. Orient Commercial Joint Stock Bank, which is OCB with over 85 branches in 80, 18 provinces in Vietnam, joins RippleNet to foster cross-border payments. Ripple will be their strategic partner onward. So that's a pretty interesting thing. And then a little bit of follow-up for that. Uh, we had Evan, um, who shared some context on OCB. It's a joint venture between the Vietnam, um, Vietnam government and BC, BNB uh, Paribas, which is, the, which is a bank. So it's a joint venture between um, a, a bank in the private sector and the government. The Vietnamese government banking industry has, gone, has deep ties to the Chinese government. This is big. It represents one more puzzle falling into place. And what did Garlinghouse say in, the, in, the, in our previous um, article? Well, basically that Asia has an incredible amount of traction. And there you go, proving the point. So I saw this, thought it was a little bit confusing. I know we talked about this recently that Uphold was going to go ahead and support the Flare Spark airdrop. But then something interesting happened. I saw this tweet pop up right here, which is the CEO of Uphold, JP Throw, had reconfirmed that Uphold will fully support the Spark distribution. Now, what was weird was that would re-support, I mean, I don't understand why they're reconfirming it, but essentially when I was looking at Spark or looking at Flair's website, initially Spark was listed as a partner and then they were, they dropped off for a sec for a while and they probably added them back in. But anyway, Flair put this tweet out that it's official that, and I don't know, for some reason they reconfirmed this. I don't know why they reconfirmed it, but they did. But uh, maybe they, maybe some, there was something going on where they were actually dropped off the official list. So who knows? Maybe they'll be unconfirmed again. But I have a feeling that where they're here to stay. Just a little bit of news I wanted to pass on. Ripple presentation highlights Bank of America partnership goes viral. Is XRP in the spotlight? Oh, yes, it is in the spotlight. Is it ever in the spotlight? So they did a presentation at Ripple Swell. Uh, they promoted um, the the partnership of Ripple and Bank of America, and obviously this has gone viral. 
It featured mock demos of both Ripple's XRP-powered cross-border payments uh, product ODL or on-demand liquidity, as well as its payment messaging system, which basically does not rely on the crypto asset. And that really is more along the likes of what Swell does. It's just a messaging system. The demos quickly caused a stir amongst investors. Hello, I'm an investor. And advocates of the fourth largest crypto asset, third, um, fourth, whatever, triggering its renewed discussion in Ripple's partnerships and exactly how Bank of America is utilizing Ripple's network of banks and financial institutions. According to the Digital Gen Financial Services CEO, Pano Makras, Ripple's payment messaging product demo used Bank of America, while Ripple's on-demand liquidity demo used the money transfer business fast remit as a corporate example. Now, during a podcast in April, Julie Harris, who's the Bank of America's head of global banking, digital strategy, we heard about this a couple times, but she was the one that shed some light on the financial giant's relationship with Ripple. She said the client experience and combination of the high touch and high tech is really important, big area of focus for us. So it's not just the capability, but the actual experience and the ability to get things done anytime, anywhere, because we are around the clock society you know we're 24 7 and the second goal was the ability to integrate she talks about derek who touched on this a lot it's not about our platform and our capabilities it's about how you as a client and the infrastructure you have and the ability for us to integrate whether that's with platforms and capabilities that are or built on partnerships that we have with the likes of ripple or swift of swift but these are fintechs we're partnering with uh, they come through all of our rigor of legal and compliance, and we're able to leverage banking on a platform we deliver to you. And this is one of the key things that I want to highlight and want to explain exactly why you are in the right place at the right time. Because the fact is that Ripple from day one was always going towards regulatory compliance. They're the biggest purveyors of getting compliance, and they were the first ones out of the gate to say, hey, let's not try to circumvent uh, – go around governments, let's try to work hand in hand with regulators and also banks. And this is a key point that I want you to focus in on. They've come through all of our rigor of legal and compliance. Now obviously SWIFT has been compliance for years because they've been around since 1973, but here's this brand new kid on the block called Ripple that's been around for eight years and Ripple passed the rigor of legal and compliance. So that's something big and this is right from the mouth of Bank of America. This is um, it's it's from it, from Julie Harris, the Bank of America's head of global banking digital strategy, back in a podcast. And I know we talked a lot about this in the community, but again, the compliance issue is absolutely huge here. Now let's jump through to this. Another big takeaway: Ripple's third annual blockchain and payments report had some interesting revelations regarding its digital asset adoption globally, despite ongoing the global pandemic. Nearly 80% of businesses reported growth in 2020. Let me say that again. Nearly 80% of businesses reported growth. That means usually it's the other way around. You might have seen 20%, but here was 80% during a pandemic. 44% of them said that innovation and payment technology was a key growth factor. So you see that because of the innovation and payments, and because we were all locked down in our houses, you see how vital that is. And that's vital at any point, but especially during a pandemic. And according to the report, there are four key benefits driving this adoption, namely improved data quality, increased data security, cost savings, and business growth. And interestingly, respondents from Latin America stood out by ranking growth as the highest benefit, followed by cost savings where more mature markets ranked cost savings and data transparency as the greatest benefit in blockchain. So there's one other thing that I wanted to look at here. The market opportunity for innovators in fintech and retail banks and those located in emerging markets is quite significant with expectations of strong continued growth. So even the emerging markets are going to see are expected to grow, especially when there's unbanked. Um, in these market segments, which is pretty solid and really phenomenal to hear. Now, Raul Paul, if you don't know who Raul Paul is, he is one of the founders of Real Vision. Real Vision is a phenomenal channel if you want to check it out. And you've probably seen him making his ways. He he, he makes the television circuit, uh, CNBCs and, and the likes. And also he's, one of, he's considered to be a, a very well-respected financial um, guru, right? So 
and he shares this, and I wanted to point to this because let's read what's behind this. An enormous wall of money. Now, we always talk about the big money coming into digital currency, right? In this case, you know, Raul Paul is a big purveyor. He loves Bitcoin. And what he's saying is the largest cryptocurrency will massively outperform gold, outperform gold. But before that, um, says or says the real wow, I really messed that up. The largest cryptocurrency will massively outperform gold. Before that, says the real vision founder. Wow, that's a weird subhead. But anyway, hitting 1 million, he thinks it's going to hit 1 million USD by 2025. He thinks it's about right. Um, and that's Raul Paul, what he's confirming. And with an interview with Stansbury Research, uh, Raul Paul, fam famous for his bullish stance on Bitcoin, said an enormous wall of money would flow into the cryptocurrency over the next few years. I think it's about right, whether it's five years, six years, when asked about the $1 million target. Now, what does that mean? If you've got this outflow of enormous wall of money, that's the big, that's not only, that's not only the institutional, but it's a lot of money that's going to be coming in. And to quote him, he said, we're going to go th through two of our having circles. And just from what I know from all the institutions, all the people that I speak to, and remember, he's speaking to the top players in the space. He's not some little guy who's speculating. He actually talks directly to the people running these large institutions. There's an enormous wall of money coming into this. It's enormous. And just, and just the pipes, there aren't enough to allow people to do it yet, and that's coming. But it's on everyone's radar screen, and there's a lot of smart people working on it. So if you look at it like this, this giant wall of inflowing money, it's going to flow massively into Bitcoin. Guess, yes, that's right. It's also going to come into Ether, XRP, and on, so we're in, in down the line of the top 10, 15, and it's going to start spreading like wildfire, right? Then Coinbase, I saw this, uh, they received almost 2,000 law enforcement information requests this year alone. Yikes, that's a lot. Then I want to get into CBDCs because there are a lot of CBDC news and it's interesting what's happening here. This story made me laugh. Digital euro within decade, very likely, said, says Finland's chief central banker. And I thought, well, that's got to be a typo. Within a decade? What's next? Within the century? Well, within a century, we certainly expect this could possibly happen. And I'm looking at this guy and I'm thinking, wait a minute, what? So the Bank of Finland governor, um, Ali Rain, told Reuters Friday that he believes the euro is very likely to debut in Europe in the next 10 years. A digital euro, I should say. In the next 10 years? What? 10 years? I mean, my God, could it be any longer? I mean, you know, is that conservative or is that what you think? Are you working with SWIFT? I mean, what is up with that timeline? Anyway, thought that was pretty an interesting that that's what he believes. 10 years. Yikes. Then, Bank of Spain to weigh digital currency design proposal implications through 2021. And then finally, we have over here, the Central Bank of Russia will limit the unqualified purchase of cryptocurrencies. Now, what's this all about? Well, from the beginning, the Central Bank of the Russian Finan Federation was quite strict about the use of crypto. And its unqualified purchase or illegal possession was considered very strict. Unqualified quantified purchase of cryptocurrency in Russia is questionable. With the recent introduction of digital assets into Russian law, which legalized cryptocurrencies as a taxable property, starting in January 2021, financial authorities have proposed strict laws regarding digital financial assets. Now, what you see happening here is like, you know, we're talking about um, the Central Bank of Russia. We're talking about the digital euro. We're talking about the potential of the digital dollar to CBDCs. And it's like, yeah, we started hearing about this stuff. It wasn't too long ago where people were started talking about the CBDCs. But now it's almost like they're trying to outrun each other, right? They're trying to be first, trying to be quick. And now that China has really moved and, and made some headway with their CBDC, all of a sudden everyone's like, they, they, they've gone from a year ago, this is just uh, ridiculous. I would never you've ever talk about it, digital anything. And now the central banks are feeling threatened. And they always have been threatened by not only Bitcoin, but digital assets and cryptocurrency in general. Why? Because it's a way to circumvent the major banks. And you know, what is the one thing that CB, you know, a central bank is going to have to give up? 
They're going to have to give up control. They don't want to give up control. That's their middle name, control. And that's one of the things that they're going to do. That's my take. I want to know yours. Let me know down below. If it's your first time here, like, subscribe, click that notification bell. Also, check out our other channel below, too. We do live streams on the other channel, uh, usually around three times a week. But it's great because you can interact with myself and Jeff. But that's all I have for right now. Let me know your comments, what you thought down below on these CBDCs and some of these other Ripple developments. I will see you on the next one. I'm out. Are you down with OTC? Please like, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified when the next video drops.